Welcome to the Master Passive Income Show. My name is Dustin Heiner, and I'm here to help you learn how to quit that J-O-B, that just overbroke job by investing in real estate so you never, ever have to work a job again. Today, I'm super excited to bring on somebody who's an expert at a market that I've never personally invested in. I know of other people that have done it, but I personally don't. But it's phenomenal, especially as people are getting older. This is residential assisted living. And I am super excited to bring on an expert who's been doing this. It's going to show us how to do this as well. I have Isabel Guarino on the show with me. Isabel, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Man, this is terrific because when you really think about real estate investing and buying real estate, it's basically you, you hold on to a property, something like a, a physical property on land, and then you rent it out for long term. It could be a storage unit, it could be apartment complex, short term, all these different types of investing. And if you are renting it out per door, per, you know, like, like this one room or, or this one, like, like Airbnb type model, you start making more money, but then you also realize your market. And I started thinking, oh my goodness, how many people are getting older all the time? The baby boomers are definitely getting older. So fast forward now, we have assisted living and getting a house and putting, it's awesome. I want you to tell us all about it. But first, tell us a little bit about you. How did you get started in doing this residential assisted living? It doesn't sound very easy. It sounds like you have to put a little effort into it. Definitely some effort. We got started, honestly, with it being really close to home. My grandmother fell, broke her hip, and she needed 24-7 care. The doctor said, hey, she's going to need assisted living. And so my family kind of was thrown into the situation. My dad had been a real estate investor for 40 years prior to this, doing all sorts of different you know, avenues of investing within real estate. And so he did quick math after visiting a bunch of homes and facilities and options for her. And he was like, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to be paying five grand a month for her to live in the home, or I could be cash flowing ten, fifteen thousand dollars on the home, and she could be living for free. So, being the you know entrepreneur that he was, he jumped right in, uh, purchased the real estate, purchased the business, and my family kind of never looked back. It became a family business, and um, it's been so much fun uh, along the way. That that's fantastic. And how, what? Well, can you give me like what year was that, and how long have you been doing this? Yeah, just about ten years ago now that happened, uh, and we started teaching and training on it about seven, eight years ago. Uh, last year, my dad passed, and so I had been working behind the scenes with him. Uh, over the eight years, building just all the companies and dealing with all the day-to-day -day stuff. And this past year, um, I, I took the front stage and have been teaching and sharing just as he did. Um, and it's been a real blessing to be able to carry on that legacy. That That's, I, I love it. And yeah, I love that you're doing this with your legacy of your dad or your dad's legacy. Like yeah. I have my children and I'm teaching them how to invest in real estate. And that's one thing that I love about real estate on top of all the benefits from passive income to, uh, you know, literally having a depre tax depreciation, all these other great things. But on top of that, I'm teaching my kids and I'm also going to be able to give them generational wealth. So I'm yeah. giving them properties yeah. and teaching them how to do it themselves. So one day I would love it if my kids, you know, they're young, but you know, hopefully they'll grow up to be able to do all this stuff as well. That's terrific. Now there's so many thoughts going through my brain on how to do this. Now at Master Passive Income, what I love to teach is creating a business that runs itself. So we don't have to do it. So my mind is automatically not going to the property where and all that stuff, which most people, they jump right to where and, and you know, how are we going to pay for it? Like that, that, We'll get there. But I want to know, how do we run a business, a residential assisted living? So is it really, really difficult to find the right people to take care of the, the elderly people that are being inside there to walk us through what does it look like building that business? Yeah. So staffing is always your most challenging part really in any business, but the way we teach and train and the way we do ourselves is that you're the owner of the real estate and the owner of the business. And you're basically hiring that licensed administrator, which in real estate world, we kind of be the property manager. They're dealing with hiring and firing the caregivers, doing all the schedule payroll. They're marketing the home, doing the tours with the families and filling the beds and just dealing with all the day-to-day -day drama. So um, in the beginning, definitely more work up and running to make sure that you and that administrator are on the same page and running everything, you know, 
smoothly, but then eventually you can definitely get to the level where you're like us, where we do one phone call a week with them and then maybe go visit the homes every other month. Like we're not on site. So it can turn passive, but it's, it is active in the beginning for sure. Pactive, right? That's what we'll call it. Half passive, half active. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. So to find that person, now it sounds like you said certified, like they have to have credentials in order to do this. How do you find somebody like that? Yeah, they're licensed through the state. So every state has a different like licensing requirement, but it's just like you would find a a caregiver if you wanted to hire them basically for your own home. You could put a job ad on Craigslist or Indeed or LinkedIn. You could go to like caregiver training schools or administrator training schools and find out who, you know, the fresh graduates are. For me, this industry is very tight knit. I I feel in most markets and everybody kind of knows everybody. So the best place to find people is through personal recommendations, um, asking other care home owners or placement agents, geriatric doctors and nurses, if they know of any administrators who are looking for a job, um, things of that nature. Got it. Can I ask you how many, how many actual properties do you as your own business and your family own? We own and operate three care homes here in Arizona. We invest in about 50 now across the country. Um, And we've taught over 8,000 students in the last, you know, couple of years. So there's a lot of, we're not a franchise. So I don't know. I don't take anything from their properties being open, but there's been a lot of properties from that uh, uh, education side of it, which is really exciting. Oh, it's fun. And that's why I have master passive income. I was quitting my job and I had a lot of friends and family members asking me how to do it. And I realized I enjoyed teaching it and then I quit. So I had plenty of extra time. So that's how all this came about. So when you're looking to buy the property, is it yeah. like, well, obviously you, it seems like there's certain criteria, like maybe not a two story because they're older, elderly, you might not want to have them go up and down the stairs, but yeah. What is the nuance of the type of home that we should be looking for if we're going to be buying for a residential assisted living? Great question. So yes, physical requirements within the property. If you have stairs, you're going to have to add in a chairlift or an elevator. So I do prefer ranch style single level, but we have a lot of students like on the East Coast. We've got a guy in Jersey who has a four story home and he put in an elevator and that makes sense. But for homes that have maybe two stories, it's it doesn't always make the most sense. So I do prefer, you know, single level. Most seniors will want private bedrooms and bathrooms. So as many bedrooms and bathrooms as you can, because depending on where you live in the country, you're allowed to have anywhere between six and 16 residents in the home. So uh, here in Arizona, we're allowed to have 10. So all my homes are 10 bedroom, 10 bath homes. They didn't start that way. We chopped them up and, you know, converted them to become that way. But square footage wise, I always like to say stick between 300 and 500 square feet per resident. So with 10 people, minimum a 3000 square foot home, upwards of 5,000 is very comfortable. Wow. Now let's talk about the numbers, meaning I, I, the, the proper, each property is going to be different, how much you gonna pay for it and, and rehab and stuff. But the business side of it, basically yeah. we have a product. Yeah. a product that somebody else is going to be renting from us. Yeah. What would we look at for expenses and how much would we look at per month? Let's just say the Phoenix area, you know, if you're, if you're yeah. in Arizona, what would the average rate be? And then what the expenses and what would potentially be the business revenue from this? Yeah. So the average rate in America to live in assisted living right now today is $4,500 a month per person. And Arizona's right on par with the national average. Our average is 4,500. So if we had 10 residents at 4,500, that's 45,000 coming in every single month. But our expenses probably fall around 30,000, including food, activities, cable, internet. I mean, paying for the caregivers, the administrator, the private chef. I mean, everything all in probably around 30. And then let's say your debt service is another five, right? Whether it's a lease or debt service, that's leaving you with, you know, $10,000 a month as the owner. So it, it, they can really be profitable. And That was also using the 4,500, which is the average number. And I always recommend doing above average because the average homes 
at least all the ones we visited that I didn't want to leave my goldfish, let alone my grandmother. Uh, I, I'm like all focused on the above average, the luxury homes and, and the nicer ones. So our homes here in Arizona are charging usually anywhere between five and 8,000 a month. And that's very common in most parts of the country. You walked us through a couple of the expenses, like you know, the administrator, private chef activities. Could you go through a little more itemized out that if you miss some, I completely understand, but walk me through other expenses. Cause these are expenses, me, us as regular, just like long-term buy and hold, you know, long-term tenant. We would never think about these things. Like I would never pay for a chef, but if they're going to pay me to hire a chef and I can make extra money, then absolutely. So walk us through the expenses that we could look at. Yeah. So your staffing is obviously going to be the biggest chunk of your expenses. So caregivers, your licensed administrator activities, whether that's pet therapy or senior yoga or musicians or uh, anything in that regard, a private chef, if you're a high end home, I would try to get a private chef in there. Um, so staffing wise, that's, that's pretty much what you're looking for. The regular house bills, like it's everything you're paying in your own house, right? Cable phone, you know, food, uh, not food, but cable phone, utilities, water, gas, anything like that. That's all normal. And then your business license renewal, your, you know, property tax, your liability insurance, maintenance, you know, uh, all of those different things. And those are all kind of running all the house bills are whatever they are in your area. You know, the, the average rates for that. Your staffing is about, caregivers get paid about a dollar or two above minimum wage. So it's not, um, it, it's a lot of money, but it's not anything outrageous. Your administrator, you can structure that pay a million different ways. We could have a two hour conversation on just that alone. Um, chefs, it's kind of a line item. They, it's, it's also not that expensive. If you think about how many kids went to culinary school and then they get out and the only job is Applebee's or Chili's, they're stoked to come work at your home where they get to cook for, you know, 10 plus people a day and try all their creations and practice, 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 and get that on their resume and actually cook what they want to cook, not, you know, a burger and fries every day, all day. So um, there's, there's a lot of things there. Liability insurance, it's about a dollar or two per day per resident. Um, it's a line item. And yeah, so it, there's, there's a bunch of different uh, things in regard to that. Obviously, in our training, we go through every single one really in depth, but hopefully that gives a little better understanding of them. That totally does. Now, two questions. How many employees for what that one property that has 10 different rooms, 10 different uh, um, tenants inside there, how many employees would you say we would need to have like from the chef to the uh, administrator and all that? And at the same time, with that, how many LLC? Should we have one property, have one LLC, like that's one business, and we create a whole another business for another property? But the, those, those two things are really something that we need to worry, not worry, but be to be thinking about. Yes. As far as the LLCs, I am not a legal or tax consultant, so I won't answer that one structurally. But in our training, we do have lawyers and legal people there for you who help you set up your LLCs and structure it all. I do like each business in their own LLC as far as how I run my own. So yes, in that regard, the home and the business, in my opinion, should be in different LLCs, but everyone likes to structure it differently. Um, that way you can be like leasing it from yourself or a lot of our students choose many different routes. They don't own and operate the business, the day to day. They only operate and own the real estate and they're leasing it to a company who's running the business in their home with a long-term contract, maybe three, five, eight years, little or no maintenance. They're not in charge of it at all. And they're charging twice the fair market rent because they've renovated the home, got it licensed and ready for assisted living. So they just own the real estate and cash flow on that have nothing to do with the day to day. What was the second expense we talked about? Yes. So a big box facility like uh, Brookdale, a Sunrise, and Atrium, their resident to caregiver ratios are usually 20 to 1, 20 to 1, or 30 to 1 at night, sometimes 50 to 1. That's insane. One person cannot take care of 20, let alone 50 people. So one of the incredible things about residential assisted living is that our ratios are significantly lower. We like to provide a four to one or five to one resident to caregiver ratio. So the quality of care is so much better and you're not having a lot of those health issues and you know UTIs and bed sores and hey, they fell and this happened. That is so minimal because it's a lot more hands-on care, which is 
incredible about what we can offer. So if you have a four to one or five to one ratio with 10 residents in the home, I'd have two people on staff and the manager coming by, you know, to help out as needed at night, eight to one or 10 to one. So maybe I'd have one person at night, but the caregivers work shifts almost like a nurse, like a 12 hour shift, maybe a 10, maybe an eight. But um, if they work a 12 hour shift, they're only working for one of your homes three or four days a week. So if you don't have more than one home, they're probably working at Joe Schmo's home down the street for the other three or four days a week. So I always encourage people to have a three pack, at least three of these homes. You can share your resources, share your staff. And if they are set up in different LLCs, you're not paying overtime because it's completely separate jobs at all three of those different homes or businesses that you're running there. So um, within the one home, if you have I would say for 10 residents, you might want to have 10 rotating caregivers who are coming and going. But again, you can share those resources between the homes. I love that idea because economies of scale too. Like when you have multifamily, you know, if you have a 25 unit apartment complex, expenses are really, really high per door. But if you have a hundred unit apartment complexes per door, those expenses come down a lot. And so I can absolutely see that. So having a, I like that idea of having three properties so you can have basically a full-time staff everywhere. Like they're, they're taken care of. They're not going and working for somebody else, which is great. Now talk to me a little bit about if we are going to renovate a property like this, I could think of like in Arizona, uh, there is, you can have houses that are, you know, 3,500 square feet, big, huge, uh, like eating areas or like, like living, not necessarily living room. They're like just a living space and mm -hmm. it's huge. Would you cut those up into rooms and then add toilets and bathrooms and all that sort of stuff? Like how would you renovate a property that's let's say 3000 square feet? I, I would want, like I said, as many private bedrooms and bathrooms as possible, but you still want all of the regular things that make a home a home. You want that living room, dining room, kitchen. You want, you know, the seating area, whether it's a little library, you're going to need an office for your administrator. So you still, you don't want to get rid of those just to maximize bedrooms and bathrooms, but the bedrooms would be significantly smaller in a 3000 square foot home than they would in a five or six. Um, so for the most part, I would say you could just try to chop up the house, you know, as best you can maximizing that space. But I would maybe if it's 3000 and on that low end um, of, you know, the recommended scale, maybe you would go with eight bedrooms and then an office or something like that and having one or two shared options, which aren't bad because you can use it as a spend down option for when someone starts to run low on their money potentially. And then you can use it as a shared bedroom instead. That that's definitely a pro tip right there. He, I never would have thought of that, but yes, like and especially when you have possibly some families like, oh, that's just too much money. Well, we have this option for you as well. We're just providing things for them, and if it works out, it works out. I love that idea. Okay, so when we're building this business, we're ideally it'd be great to have three units that are ten, uh, the max that which you could have. Yeah. What would be the minimum? amount of rooms, like how many tenants would you have in one property? Would like four be way too little and it's just too much work and you weren't not making enough money? Like what would you say the cutoff would be? For the owner operator, it's the exact amount of work for one resident or 10 residents. So for the people listening who are not going to be the caregivers or the administrator, I'm always going to tell you, go to your maximum, whatever the maximum is, because you have to get the business license renewal, the liability insurance, do the renovations, hire the staff, get the food, do all this stuff. If you're doing it for one, you can do it for 10, right? So it's a lot, lot, lot better for the owner operator to go to the max. That is the recommended number. Now in states like Texas, Illinois, Ohio, New Jersey, the max is 16. So you're not going to find a 16, you know, bedroom, bathroom home on the market, but we have plenty of students in all those markets who just did a different option, right? We teach you how to lease a home for this, how to buy an existing facility. So buy the business, buy the real estate, how to convert a single family home into one of these. And then last buy land and build custom from the ground up. So one of those two options I would prefer for a 16 bedroom, you know, home, because these seniors are going to want, you know, th th this is their end of life. They want privacy. They want luxury. They want it to be nice and they want to feel well taken care of. So having those, you know, luxury properties that are custom built are amazing. So if we were to look at how much it would cost for the administrator, yeah. I'm looking at, if you said 10 pro or sorry, 10 tenants, 
average is probably three thirty thousand dollars per month for expenses, yeah. and that comes at about thirty three thousand dollars per um, per tenant. Now, yeah. with that, how much would a one administrator, like the person that's overseeing the property, making sure that it's running for you, like making sure the food's bought, making sure people are scheduled, and all that sort of stuff? How much does somebody like that would you have to pay in salary for somebody like that? Yeah. So the administrator pay can be structured a bunch of different ways. They could be like, if a caregiver is getting a dollar or two above minimum wage, they might be getting a dollar or two more than the caregiver. It could be like that. It could be a salary. It could be a flat rate per home that you're having them oversee because it's not full time to have them oversee one home. About two to four homes is full time for an administrator. So you might have a flat rate per home. If they're going to be in charge of marketing and doing the tours and filling the beds, I like to pay them a percentage based on how many beds are full. The more full the home is, the more I pay you. You can have them own a percentage of your business. You could do profit share with them. I mean, the list goes on and on on how you can pay them, but it's not this outrageous $250,000 a year job. It's really not. It's It ends up being a couple dollars more than the caregiver per hour when you dice it out at the end of the day. That's awesome. Now, I could see... Definitely a lot of people becoming or baby boomers becoming old enough to where they need something like this. Do you have any statistics, not statistics, but like numbers of how many people are retiring that would be eventually be getting in this age where they need these assisted living? I got numbers all day for you. <laughs> right now, the silent generations who's living in assisted living, right? And there's only 44 million of them. The baby boomers, there's 76 million of them. And they're still about 10, 20 years out from really needing assisted living. So we are currently 1.3 million beds short. And we're about to almost double the amount of seniors that need beds, but they're projecting that we're only building about 50,000 beds per year. So this is a massive crisis, supply and demand, uh, all economics 101, right? This is a huge issue. We call it the silver tsunami, right? Everyone talks about the greatest transfer of wealth from the baby boomers to Gen X or millennials. They're forgetting that assisted living costs an average of $4,500 a month and 70% of people are going to need it for an average of three and a half years. So this is a big chunk of change that's not going to get transferred to the next generation. It's parking itself right in assisted living. I always tell people whether you want to do RAL, residential assisted living or not, get involved somehow with this big crisis. Like, I don't care if you want to own a diaper company or a medical bed company or whatever it is, but you should be investing in something to do with seniors and the aging population because this is a huge opportunity. It's like if we had a crystal ball in 2008, that's what this is right now. I love that. And uh, it, it it's definitely looking like it's just going to need, we're going to need more and more and more. And I like that you have the numbers because it really puts in a perspective that is, is, a, is a need. It's definitely a good need. Now, we've talked a lot about the great things about and really, really good things about this. Let's talk a little bit about little concerns that could pop, possibly come up. Obviously, you know, if somebody quits on you, like, oh, my goodness, we have to, you know, make sure that that's taken care of. But a big one for me as an investor the short term, uh, I would say the life cycle of a tenant, hopefully they're going to stay in there. I like them, you know, two, three, five years, but sadly, as they're getting older, eventually it happens that they might pass away. And then you have to fill that. Talk to us about turnover in these properties. Yep. So the average stay is about three and a half years in an assisted living home, but you should never stop marketing because someone could move in and pass the month, the next month. Like you don't know, you really don't. We had a woman who was on hospice for seven years with us hospice. Like the family thought she was going to go at any second, but nope, she just. <laughs> yeah. I've been years like you never know. So it's very strange. I will say this, the more they pay, the longer they stay. And it sounds bad, but it's very true because when money's tight with a family, they will wait till the absolute last second to move mom or dad in because they don't have a lot of money to spare. And they, so they will wait, 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 wait. Okay. We move them in. And then they die a lot faster versus the homes that are much more expensive. You have people moving in who you're like, 
do you even need this? Like, I feel like you're doing good, but the kids, you know, went to visit at Christmas and there was medication not taken or the food was expired. And they're like, dad needs assisted living. Let's get him in now. And then they move in way sooner because they say, well, we want him to be there and make friends and all this stuff. So doing those higher end above average homes, definitely. I feel like the ratios of how long they're staying there is a lot longer, but you are correct. There is turnover in these homes, you know, 90% of people will pass in uh, and uh, who come into the assisted living home, they'll pass there. And it is a sad thing, right? But it's also a life thing. And there's a lot of different factors to consider with that. Marketing, as the owner, you should never stop marketing. Even when you're full, you still want to be marketing. Put your name out there. Put your word out there. What are you doing in your home? Why would people want to consider this? You can be building your waiting list right away. Now, with the families and the caregivers, right, you always want to be in strong communication with them. And if they're noticing anything going on with mom or dad, hey, you guys might want to start coming over more often. We're seeing some signs and some things. And hopefully the families do come over more. But you also have to consider when someone's writing a check to you for seven grand a month, it's either coming from mom and dad's bank account, which is their inheritance, or their bank account. So after two and a half, three and a half years, they start to almost feel a little relieved because it's a lot of money out of pocket for this. And yes, they're sad, but this isn't a nine-year-old who got killed in a car accident. It's a 95-year-old who needs help getting out of bed, showering, bathing, eating. They know this is end of life and that's why they're in an assisted living to start with. So with the families and, you know, they are a lot more understanding than you would think. Um, but it is vital that you pretty much are super sensitive to them, super caring, help them with that process, hook them up with, you know, all the different things that they need and fill that bed as soon as you can. I, I, I appreciate that answer. That's really good. The other thought with turnover too, is employees turning over of employees. I, I definitely concerned about turnover in general for every part of my business, real estate to business in general. Um, Talk to us about turnover of employees and how to make sure that we are not the ones that are, oh, my goodness, somebody quit. I have to go over to the house and I have to start scrubbing grandma or, you know, I, I don't yeah. really want to do that. I want to have a business that actually runs itself. So talk to us about turnover of employees. Yes. So luckily, because you have that administrator in place, when a caregiver gets fired or quits on you, you might not even know about it because that administrator's job is to fill that spot with someone else and or do the role themselves. You're actually not licensed or legally allowed to go over there and help with the seniors. You can go over there, but you can't be taking care of them um, because you're not licensed to do it. So you as the owner don't have to worry about that. That's really the administrator's you know role there. But caregivers, it is a tough job. It is such a tough job. And 80% of the industry is run by immigrants. So our home has people from all over the world, whether it's Romania, South Africa, the Philippines, we have the most incredible staff, but it's really important to note that, that this is a tough job, not only on your heart, but on your body, on your mind. It's just a lot. So being able to pay them maybe a dollar or two more than all the other facilities, also considering if they worked at a big box and they were taking care of 20 and one person and now they come work for you and it's a four to one, they're going to be like, this job is a breeze. Like they're going to, they're going to love working for you because it's so much more fair. It's, and so they have a lot better time working there, but I think I'm very, very heavy in our training on like uh, employee retention and things that you can do to make people feel loved and appreciated right? Over the last two years, we had the great resignation and everybody quitting their jobs. And I, I read this survey that said 70% of people when surveyed of why they left their job said it wasn't for more money. It was because they didn't feel appreciated. And I think that really speaks to our work culture here in America. People just hire people, treat them terrible, don't pay them well, and expect them to go above and beyond. It, things are shifting. Employees are saying, uh-uh, like respect me. And I think that's very, very important. When people come in, we try to learn everything we can about them. What's your goal? Do you want to be a nurse? Do you have kids? Like what's going on with this? And then we try to support them in all those different ways. I also feel it's important to note if you're going to be cash flowing 10, 15, 20 grand a month on one home, you have a lot of money to be flexible with and play with, right? And so you are able to give back to the people working in your home, living in your home. Um, I'm all about uh, like service 
And I think it's really, really important that one of my caregivers starts showing up late every day. And it's like, what's going on? Oh, well, my tire, I need a new tire. A tire is a couple hundred bucks, but for them, it might be half a month's wages. For me, it's nothing. So being able to just buy them fresh tires and now they're like, oh, I am loyal to you. Like you, you take care of me, you get me. And it means nothing to me, but to them, it's everything. No big box owner is going to do that. Like they don't care. They'll be like, you're showing up late, you're fired, but you have that opportunity to give back in so many ways. And I think that that's the beautiful thing about this. It's not just an investment strategy. It's a way to make an impact in the world. I love that. And that's something that I love to be able to do is serve as many people as possible. Um, and so making an impact is just fantastic. Now, what happens if the administrator, you know, they they find another place or that you have to sadly find another administrator and God forbid they get an accident or something, but you have to really scramble for that. Have you encountered that? And what would we do? The biggest thing that I always do is have an assistant administrator in place at all times. So pretty much if they quit last minute suddenly and something happens, okay, the assistant one steps in and we're immediately looking for another. But if they, you know, hopefully give you some time and some, if you're treating them really well, fingers crossed, they're saying, hey, this is what's up. This is what I want to do. I'm, I'm leaving in two, three weeks. And it gives you a little time, but an assistant administrator, which could just be a caregiver who's showing a lot of initiative and you say, hey, I want to start training you for this. I'm going to pay you a little bit more. And now they have all this pride and they're excited to do it. And they step in in the interim. That's terrific. What other potential problems what what have you seen like what do your your uh your students come across where you're like okay th i've seen this before and it happens this is how you handle it. like what other problems could we maybe not necessarily expect but possibly see yeah i think a lot of people are usually concerned about hoas or angry neighbors that's one i hear often and because of the federal fair housing act it's actually discriminatory against uh, you know, disabled people, which by the time you need assisted living, you're considered disabled um, to say that they can't live in that neighborhood or in that home. So even though the HOA might say, well, you can't have a business here. Well, that means the realtor, the accountant, the lawyer, the work from home girl who has an Etsy shop, all of us have to shut down if you're going to shut me down. <laughs> so we created actually the RAL National Association, which represents all 30,000 of these care homes across the country. And we have legal backing and power there for you. If an HOA or an angry neighbor tries to stop you, you have the Federal Fair Housing Act and RALNA on your side to help protect you. Oh, uh, man, that's that's fantastic. Wow. Okay. So Isabel, you give us so much great insights. I know people are definitely going to want to reach out to you and learn how to do this. Um, how can they find you? How can they reach out to you online? Yeah. RAL101.com is a great place to go to get started. I've got a free book for you there. If you want to schedule a call with me or my team, we have that available. We've got webinars, we've got downloads, all sorts of fun stuff there for you guys, all free of charge. So go check it out. Learn more. RAL101.com. That's great. And what about social media? Social media, you can find us on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, Facebook at RAL Academy. So you can just search us there and we're having a lot of fun on social. So feel free to follow, comment, ask us any questions there. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> we were also talking that you're potentially starting a podcast. Do you have a name yet? So if they're going to listen to this a little bit later, they might be able to find you. Ooh, I have a name, but I, I, I don't know if we've locked it in. So I don't know if I want to share it yet, <laughs> but it will be coming soon. A podcast coming soon for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, Isabel, it's been so fantastic learning about the residential assisted living. I think it's, it's definitely a need as yeah. well as a great opportunity for a lot of investors. So thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Dustin. Nice to be here with you.